course, it will be wrong to think that economics can solve all this issue because many other factors also play an important role, yeah, including the so-called quote-unquote non-economic factors like politics, sociology. In economic policy, in my experience, we realize that we are not living in the first best world or ideal world. We are probably living in the second best or maybe fourth best world and run by the fifth best bureaucracy. And we can't complain with that. Yeah, we have to work within constraint. Uh, in academic, we can talk about the ideal solution. If the institution still in the Jurassic Park and we provide a policy recommendation like a Star Wars, this is not going to work. We have to be very realistic with the situation. During my time when I was a, a finance minister, when I was in the government, I often uh, told IMF or the World Bank that their policy recommendation was really good, you know, perfect. But it can only be implemented 25 years from now because it requires a perfect institution. A famous scientist, Charles Darwin, yeah, uh, he said that it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligence that survive. It is the one that it is most adaptable to change. This is also very similar to the capitalism, to the global capitalism. Well, I think it does. Uh, there are several reasons of why economics, in my view, uh, matters. But first, uh, it provides us with a framework to understand about the concept uh, of scarcity, yeah, or how to deal with the basic uh, economic issue of the unlimited wants uh, versus un, uh, uh, limited resources, yeah. And based on that, this, this uh, economics provide a framework to understand about the importance of priorities, about choice, and somehow also people's behavior. Yeah. Uh, and I do believe that the problem of choice, of scarcity, uh, is really an everyday problem for people. That is why this economics tries to provide a framework uh, it is very useful even for uh, everyday uh, people problem. Uh, secondly, uh, it also provides uh, you know, a framework how to design a policy, for example, yeah? uh, including, for example, to boost economic growth or dealing with the issue like inflation or even economic crisis. Uh, it helps us partially uh, to you know, to provide uh, the issue of this, uh, dealing with the issue of the social protection, yeah. Uh, but of course, it will be wrong to think that economics can solve all this issue because many other factors also play an important role, yeah, including the so-called quote-unquote non-economic factors like politics, sociology, or, you know, uh, other, 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 other factors. Uh, in my life as a, a former minister of finance, I was lucky to get an opportunity to address the financial turbulence during the taper tantrum 2013. And I got a chance to implement the policy based on the economic framework. And it helps uh, us to bring back the financial stability after seven months. So, So I could see you know, in reality, how does this economics uh, matters even than uh, policy implementation? I like this question, particularly because much of my work is a combination between economics, public policy, and uh, people. 
and I was lucky to get a chance for wearing two hats as an academic and also a policymaker. And one thing that I learned from this experience, I was humbled by the political reality. Yeah, and this is exactly what happened as an academic. Uh, we learn or we discuss about the so-called the positive economics such as what is, what was. We try to uh, grasp the reality in economic models, uh, formalizing through the so-called the mathematical models. This helped us to provide a framework. Yeah, but unfortunately, we cannot generalize this model in all cases in the world. There is no such thing as one size fits all. The mathematical model helped us to, uh, you know, to uh, focus our study to look at the causality between some variables. Uh, it helped us for analytical, but unfortunately, economic policy is very different. Yeah, uh, in economic policy, in my experience, we realize that we are not living in the first best world or ideal world. We are probably living in the second best or maybe fourth best world and run by the fifth best bureaucracy. And we can't complain with that. Yeah, we have to work within constraint. Uh, in academic, we can talk about the ideal solution. Yeah, we can assume about the ideal solution. But uh, in reality, it's a very different. Uh, we have to implement policy in, in perfect world. How to do economic reform, for example, within uh, some political constraint. Yeah. As we know that economic theory uh, provides us a framework on the impact on some policy or reform to society. But unfortunately, uh, economic silent on how to do it. Yeah, economic policy deals with the political, sociology, anthropolog anthropological, legal issue. And we have to, we are not uh, implementing this in the vacuum situation. We have to work uh, within constraint. So that is why the, uh, a policy, economic policy, I do believe that is very different with the, the uh, what you call the economic science or academic economics. Economic does provide framework or insight uh, on the implication of uh, government policies. Uh, in my experience, for example, uh, it provides insight on how to improve the targeting of the subsidy, for example. Let me, let me uh, share with you the experience of Indonesia. Yeah? In Indonesia, uh, we subsidize the gasoline because this is the easiest way, the simple way to provide the social protection to people uh, where large informal sectors uh, uh, is, is here. And we don't have data to provide the very targeting social protection. That is why, that's the reason why uh, simplest way to provide the social protection is by providing the fuel subsidy. But unfortunately, this kind of policy uh, is biased towards the middle and upper class. Because the one who get a benefit from this fuel subsidy is actually a middle and upper class. They are the one who consume the gasoline with their cars, etc. Yeah, the link for the middle and lower income group to the gasoline is through the public transport. Yeah, so that is why you know we decided at that time to adjust the fuel price and we reallocate the money, uh, the subsidy, to the poor people using the so-called the direct cash transfer. The interesting part is, how do we targeting the poor when we don't have data? Yeah, uh, it, in my experience, rather than targeting the poor, it is better to let the poor to show themselves. And this is very interesting to me because uh, this is related to the idea of the people response to incentive. So let me share with you this story. You know. uh, we don't have data. We didn't have data at that time. But we made the process of this, this uh, disbursement or distribution of this uh, cash transfer uh, 
like in the queue, uh, a bit difficult. So everyone have to wait for several hours to get the cash transfer for $15 at a time. The reason why we made this process rather difficult, if you are come from the middle and upper class, I don't think that you will spend a lot of time to queue for 15 bucks. So the one who were queuing at the time, more or less must come from the lower middle income group because they badly need the money. So, you know, and, and it worked. Based on that, we can identify uh, the, the poor people we get the uh, data and we try to, you know, to, to use the information based on that. But uh, in other uh, different situation, uh, we believe that people respond to incentive, but not always that the case. You know? For example, like in the case of this pandemic, we, we sometimes we, we, we are wondering why, uh, you know, in the case of Indonesia, even the, the uh, middle and upper income group or the educated one, it's very difficult for them to stay at home, even though they realize that the risk is there for the pandemic. And probably one of the reasons behind it is because the issue of this cognitive bias, etc. Yeah. So, so I would say that this uh, economics uh, play a role in society it provides a useful framework but i think it will be difficult to say that uh, there is the so-called the one size fits all for everything and it serves a common goods yes it does uh, in some of the issues but in other issues we probably have to look at you know uh, uh, this issue more carefully not only from the economic perspective but also from uh, other uh, perspective. Well, the answer is how do we define economics here? Yeah, if we define economics as a concept of this invisible hand or entirely believe in the market mechanism, maybe the answer is no. Yeah. Let me give an example. Look at the case of the distribution of vaccine nowadays. Yeah, we are facing a problem here because the inequality of the distribution. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Economist magazine, for example, stated that a rich country with the population less than 15% in the world, total population control about more than 50% of the total vaccine production. Yeah, and for the developing countries, emerging economies, uh, some emerging economies or developing countries have difficulties in obtaining vaccine. Yeah, inequality in distribution will complicate this global recovery. So if we let everything go to market, I think it will be very difficult. Yeah, and related to that, to make uh, things worse, yeah, uh, the third wave of the pandemic uh, have taken place in several countries. So, you know, understandable that some countries uh, puts their own uh, interest first. And so we learn about something that what we call the vaccine nationalism. In this situation, reminds me with the situation in the uh, game theory about the prisoner's dilemma. That when everyone try to serve their own self-interest, yeah, we end up like in the suboptimal situation because we don't want to cooperate. And this is the this is the reality that we are facing, the problem that we are facing now. Yeah. So to, to solve this problem, we somehow need the cooperation. Yeah. Um, so if we let everything like you know will be solved by the market clearing of the invisible hand, I don't think economics could solve this problem. But we also understand that economic thinking is also dynamic here yeah we learned from our mistake in the past uh, that the market failure exists we also learn there is a room for the government intervention for the market failure uh, we also learn about the importance of the sustainable development 
externalities, etc. So uh, back again to your question, I do believe is if we define the economics in a very a narrow definition, maybe the answer is no. It will it could not solve the problem of the issue of climate change, pandemic, etc. But I do believe that economic thinking is also uh, dynamic, and you know try to learn from the uh, uh, past experience, including our mistake in the past. This is a difficult question, yeah. Uh, because even though economics is considered science, we like to, to claim that economics is a science that has a robust uh, methodology that tries to measure variables, variables yeah, uh, on their objects uh, scientifically. But it is still a social science where there are many things uh, are not exact like the engineering, for example. Yeah, uh, there are four recommendations from economists uh, should be uh, taken carefully. And these policy recommendations are relative and we should also understand the assumption behind it. Yeah, uh, for example, my joke is <clears throat> if the institution still in the Jurassic Park and we provide a policy recommendation like a Star Wars, this is not going to work. We have to be very realistic with the situation. During my time when I was a, a finance minister, when I was in the government, I often uh, told IMF or the World Bank that their policy recommendation was really good, you know, perfect. But it can only be implemented 25 years from now because it requires a perfect institution. It is unfortunately developing countries, emerging economies, we don't really have the very well established institution. Yeah, so, so we have to be very realistic on the situation. That is why, in my opinion, economists must be responsible professionally for their advice, but the policymakers must have their judgment and also look at carefully about this policy recommendation, whether this is suitable or not for the implementation on the ground. Yeah, I mentioned, uh, you know, based on my experience, one thing that I learned as a policymaker is I'm humbled by the political reality. This is a big and complex question, yeah. If you want to simplify the essence of capitalism are essentially perhaps private ownership, the role of the market mechanism to allocate resources efficiently so we can have this, we can do the capital uh, accumulation. Uh, with this kind of system or model, we reward for economic uh, agent to get the most profitable you know, results for themselves, yeah. Of course, all this uh, scheme or way of thinking departs from the self-interest motive, yeah. Uh, what we see today are the variation of this concept, yeah. It's no longer rigid as what imagine or we uh, discussed earlier. Let me give an example about the case of the several countries in East Asia. Uh, I still think that uh, it is capitalism where capital accumulation uh, play an important factor, but there is a hybrid between private ownership here and also the role of state through the state-owned enterprise. Yeah, uh, in the case of China, for example, we can also see how the government play a role in some East Asian countries like in Japan or Korea. Yeah, uh, we also known as the so-called the state capitalism. Singapore, how do you define Singapore? Yeah, Singapore's government owns controlling shares in many government-linked companies or the uh, GLC and direct investment through the sovereign wealth fund. 
But if you look at on the survey economic freedom, you will call that you know Singapore is a country with you know rely so much on this uh, market mechanism. Yeah. So so uh, the way I look at it, the uh, self interest motive is still there, but there is a lot of variation of it. Yeah. In which that the role of the government uh, is you know. Uh, becoming also important, not like in the narrow definition that uh, we discussed before. Yeah, focusing only on the private ownership, capital accumulation, and let the market works. Yeah, so so this is the way we look at. Uh, you know, this is the way I define the capitalism is more on the uh, from the dynamic perspective. To answer your question, let me uh, quote uh, a famous scientist, Charles Darwin. Yeah, uh, he said that it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligence that survive. It is the one that it is most adaptable to change. This is also very similar to the capitalism, to the global capitalism. History shows that capitalism has also experienced, you know, evolution, and there were various corrections to the capitalism. Let me give an example. Uh, the seminal works of the greatest economist in the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes. I would call this is perceived as the reform from within, because what he did actually to save capitalism from socialist, communist, and fascist force during the Great uh, Depression era. Yeah. Um, and I think this is one of the, you know, the uh, important thing about this capitalism. They allow a correction. Yeah. And if you look at what happened in the 1980s, the pendulum swing to uh, the, other, uh, uh, the other side, the neoliberal thinking, uh, Reaganomics, uh, Thatcherism gave inspiration to the various economic policies in the world. Economic deregulation were uh, everywhere. The role of the governments become very limited. And I recall what the Nobel laureate Milton Friedman said that government is the problem. You know, people uh, he he modified what Adam Smith uh, said that people who intend only to serve. Uh, public interests are led by invisible hand to serve private interests. It was not part of their intention. Yeah, people were worried about the issue of the rent seeking, corruption, etc. Including in Indonesia, uh, we got the experience that government is very bad in picking winner, but losers are very good in picking government. Yeah, because this issue of this corruption and the pendulum swung to the the so called let the you know, give more room to the market. But the Asian financial crisis and recently the global financial crisis, you know, gave us a big uh, lesson that there is a room for the government intervention, especially on the regulation in the financial uh, sector. Yeah, I was in the government. We had to deal with the global financial crisis at that time. You know, we learned that, you know, somehow, we have to regulate this financial sector and look at the, the pandemic problem now, the COVID-19. If you look at the theme of the fiscal stimulus all over the world, is do whatever it takes. Almost every country in the world now doing the so-called the fiscal stimulus, providing the social protection uh, to the uh, people uh, to help the small medium enterprise. So it really changed the. If you look at the, you know, the perspective from the perspective of these uh, 1980s, probably will be we call it the the end of this the so-called the neoliberal. Yeah. Let me, perhaps let me let me share with you, how do I see the role of this ideology here? Yeah, in this pendulum. Uh, let me take the experience of Indonesia, during the 70s. There were a lot of government intervention at that time. The reason behind it was very simple. 
because Indonesia at that time as an oil exporter country, we had money. So there was a room for the government intervention in many aspects, in many sectors, because we could afford to do it. In the mid 80s, the oil price collapsed. The same government who introduced that many government intervention started to begin with the idea of economic deregulation. Yeah, so to me, the ideology play a role as an effect rather than cause here. Yeah, because you know we don't have money, then we become very pragmatic, we move to the market, not because the ideological reason. Yeah. So this is the way I look at the situation, and then uh, if we look at the very recent situation, yeah, uh, for example, people also respond. We are talking about, for example, about the globalization. But recently, we realized that the emergence of identity politics, maybe because the impact of this globalization, inequality, the sentiment of uh, anti-immigrants, for example, yeah, and then economists try to uh, sort of like to improve the situation, make a correction um, by providing a critics. So one, one article that I remember very much is there is an article by Danny Roderick and the title is How to Save Globalization from Its Cheerleaders. Yeah, the way I look at this an, an article is a reform from within. How to save the capitalism? Yeah, um, but the question is, maybe a couple of years from now, people will start to question also the role of the government. If the government intervene too much, then there will be a reaction from the people. Let me give an example about the disruption of the technology. How do we put the role of government in the situation of this disruption? because the digital technology. The product cycle is getting shorter and shorter. There is no way that the government could introduce the regulation because six months after that, your regulation is gonna be, is gonna be obsolete. So the ideal solution for this is, we should have the agile bureaucracy. But there is no way government or bureaucracy can be agile. Agile bureaucracy is an oxymoron. There is no way bureaucracy can be HR. So probably we have to change the mindset from agree on rules to agree on principle. So this is just to show an example, you know, how dynamic the situation. Maybe at this moment, the role of the government become very crucial, but I don't know, uh, 15 years from now, people will start to question if the government intervene too much. There are several things here. Yeah. Uh, uh, first, I think we we have to live with the reality. We know that capitalism is the major paradigms nowadays. Even though there are many shortcomings of capitalism or neoliberalism, uh, but as I said, you know, uh, thought are also uh, dynamics. And then where the traditional concept is also developing and changing. Uh, in macroeconomic theory, for example, we start to recognize that the assumption of the you know, uh, sticky price, sticky wages, yeah, uh, should be uh, incorporated into the model. In microeconomics, we also learn about the issue of the asymmetric information. Yeah, so, so economic itself, the definition, you know, is, uh, is very dynamic, yeah. But also in the other hand, we see also that uh, countries who introduce the common markets uh, were having problems and become more pragmatic. Look at the case of China or Vietnam. Yeah, politically, ideologically, they are talking about this uh, socialism, communism, but if you look at on the implementation, they somehow depend so much on the on the market. So in my view, many countries are more pragmatic now. Yeah. Um, 
the similar uh, situation to the issue of the climate change, for example. Yeah. So we have to addressing issue of climate change, inequality, pandemic. Yeah. So what will happen in my view is uh, there will be the so-called reform from within. Yeah. Starting from, uh, you know, criticisms toward the uh, shortcomings of the capitalism. Look at what happened during the industrial revolution. The criticisms uh, toward the working and the uh, living condition at the time. And then we also learn that capitalism tried to improve themselves. Uh, critics uh, come from John Maynard Keynes about the uh, important role of the government, especially during the recession. We also look at the uh, that the government should play a role in the case of pandemic, the issue of climate change. So looking at this historical process, I do believe that what would happen will be a tug of war between this ideology. And we will perhaps end up with the so-called, with the hybrid capitalism. Yeah, hybrid capitalism means that uh, market works, but there is a role for the government here and there, industrial policy, inequality, social protection, etc.